Hi, I'm Alex, and this is the movie The Killer. An assassin who fails a mission kills all the people involved in the order. The movie begins in Paris, in a rundown apartment, where an unnamed assassin has taken up residence. The assassin waits for several days for his victim, admiring the beauty of the city from the window, listening to music, practicing yoga, and having backstage conversations. Once in a while, he goes outside, disguised as a tourist, to stock up on food and chat on the phone with his superiors. The hitman warns that he'll wait a couple more days before shutting down the operation. The target never showed up. After the conversation, the disposable smartphone is crumpled by the powerful heel of a rugged man so that no one can trace the signal. Back at the hideout, the assassin views passersby through the prism of a telescopic sight. In it, people seem less annoying. In the evening, the man is packing his sniper rifle when he suddenly hears footsteps outside the door and the rustling of a key in the keyhole. Intercepting the weapon, he sneaks to the entrance. The door is ajar and the mailman lazily tosses a stack of mail through the crack, then leaves without getting a welcome piece of lead in his head. Without waiting for his target, the assassin goes to sleep on a window-level table. From time to time, he wakes up on his alarm clock to make sure that no one drives into the house across the street. On one such awakening, he notices a commotion. The maid is preparing the room for check-in. Time to get to work, the assassin realizes and reassembles his rifle. Having leveled the table to a convenient height for shooting, the killer waits for the object. He appears in the company of a girl of low moral principles, but high financial rates. The killer carefully prepares for the shot, burying drops in his eyes, equalizing the pulse with breathing techniques. The killer watches through the lens of the scope, waiting for the right moment. The chance comes when the dominatorix walks out to the client. The killer aims for the head, pulls the trigger, the bullet flies, and kills the prostitute who made a careless step before reaching the right head. Realizing that the task has failed, the killer promptly leaves the lair. Downstairs, wearing a helmet for camouflage, he unhooks his moped and drives away, trying not to meet the police cars that have swarmed like flies on honey. As he pirouettes through the streets of Paris, the man gets rid of his weapon, throwing it away in various places, including the back of a garbage truck. After weaving through the narrow alleys enough, the mercenary leaves his moped and continues on foot, throwing his helmet into the river. At the nearest public restroom, he washes himself thoroughly to wash away the smell of gunpowder gases and changes into clean clothes. Then he goes to the airport, throwing the last barrel into the trash at the entrance, having previously sprayed it with a special spray. Noticing police officers with a dog near the check-in desk, the man goes to the restroom for reassurance, where he once again feels that he is thoroughly washed. Once past the check-in desk, he calls his boss, from his disposable cell phone for further instructions. But there are none. Having stomped on the device in the restroom, the killer waits for boarding. Already in the cabin, he notices a suspicious passenger wearing dark glasses. Later he sees him at customs, a very suspicious coincidence. As if they were not on the same flight, noticing him again in the waiting room, the killer decides to accept the offer of the overloaded company and fly out the next day in exchange for a free hotel stay. Afterward, he sets up plate and glass sound traps so no one enters unnoticed. He spends the night sitting in a chair with a knife on the nightstand, having waited for no one on his soul. The next day, the man goes to the Dominican Republic, where he has a secret hideout on the ocean. When he arrives at the address, he notices boot prints and a mountain of cigarette butts at the entrance. Someone has been sitting in ambush. Grabbing a gun from the glove compartment, the killer runs cautiously toward the house fearing that the intruders are still waiting for him. Inside the bungalow, he finds signs of a struggle and bloodstains, but does not find his girlfriend. Having learned by phone that she is in intensive care, the killer runs to the hospital. There sits the girl's brother, who tells everything he has learned from his sister. There were two attackers, a man and a woman. Their goal was not a robbery at all. The victim managed to stab the man in the leg and ran into the woods, there, she spotted a green cab in which the assailants drove away. The killer stays with her friend in the ward. The doctor says that the girl's condition has stabilized so that she can be moved to a private clinic. The killer holds out money to the doctor, but she does not take it. When the girl regains consciousness, 
She confesses that the attackers were looking for him, but she did not tell them anything. Immediately after that, the killer turns on John Wick mode, digs up a special safe in the garden, full of all sorts of interesting things. He packs a suitcase with a bunch of fake documents, weapons, and clean clothes, and then goes hunting. Driving around the city, the killer tracks down a green cab. The search leads him to the right taxi stand, where he breaks in at night, threatening the guard with a gun. Using a computer with an interface straight out of Fallout, the assassin learns the name of the driver who took the order during the attack. Grabbing his file and some change from the cash register to fake a robbery, the man leaves. In the afternoon, he sends a package to the driver's name to see who exactly will pick it up from the taxi stand. Having noticed the boy, the killer later gets into his car, disguised as a passenger. During the ride, he pulls out a gun. The cab driver gives him his wallet, believing it to be a simple robbery, but the passenger wants information about who he was bringing to his house. The driver tells him about a couple, an older woman and a muscular jock. After learning everything he needs to know, the hitman tells him to turn under an overpass, where he puts a bullet in the back of the driver's head in cold blood. Then, he goes to the airport, from where he flies to New Orleans under another false name. There, he rents a van under a different name, indulging in memories of how a certain Professor Hodges convinced a young law student to go to the dark side for money, cookies, and the opportunity to kill people. In a rented van, the killer travels to one of his warehouses, where he keeps a whole arsenal and a bunch of ancillary items like fake license plates. The next stop on his journey is a host store, where he stocks up on a trash can and other tools. Dressed as a garbage man, a hitman is on duty outside the office of his boss, Professor Hodges. He sees the secretary Dolores going to work. The killer enters the building, disguised as a janitor, along with a courier from the postal service. To keep his face light, he walks through the door with him as a pair. On the right floor, the killer counts the number of seconds it takes to close the door to Hodges' office. When the courier comes out, he manages to grab the door and walk inside. Dolores recognizes him at once and understands that he has not come to drink tea. The mercenary tells her to tie up the boss and to fasten herself with a clamp in the restroom. The assassin needs the contacts of the customer of the failed assignment and the cleaners who tried to eliminate him. Using a pneumatic nail hammer, he destroys two of Hodges' laptops where data on the illegal work was stored. Next, he drives three nails into the boss's chest, reminding him that he will die soon if he doesn't get help. But if Hodges rats out the customer, he uses his mutant magnetism to pull the nails out and call an ambulance. However, the boss hangs on to the last, bleeding to death on a carefully laid newspaper. When he lets out his last breath without saying anything, the killer drags a dumpster to remove the body. Then, he goes to the restroom, where Dolores ate a pack of pills, hoping to die quickly, but miscalculated the dosage. The secretary offers him a deal. She'll give him her clients and executors, and he won't hide her corpse. Then, the kids can get insurance, which won't happen if she goes missing. He agrees. They go home with Dolores, where the killer digs through a file cabinet until he gets three cards with three names, two co-workers, one customer. Leaving the room, the killer breaks a woman's neck in front of the stairs, simulating an accident. He then returns to the warehouse, where he methodically cuts up Hodge's corpse. Later, while taking a ferry, the man carefully dumps a bucket overboard with his boss's severed fingers and ripped teeth. Without them, the corpse is much harder to identify. He buries the body himself in a deserted area. Having spent the night in a cheap motel, the killer thoroughly washes off. All the evidence at a self-service car wash then returns, taking the car to a rental company. Under a new alias, he rents another car and heads to Florida, to the first of three addresses. As he drives by, he sees Target practicing in his yard and training his pit bull. Killer makes a simple plan. He stocks up on ground beef, sleeping pills, and a bottle of beer at the store, then drives back to the Target's house. He dozes off in the auto until the evening when the Target's friends come to pick him up. After following them to the casino, the killer notices that the Target is limping, affected by a knife wound from a friend. After waiting for the Target to return, the killer follows to put the plane into action. After waiting for time, he walks to the fence, attracting the attention of the dog, who throws a stuffing stuffed with sleeping pills over the fence. After waiting for the barking to subside, the hitman sets out to do the deed. He cautiously sneaks into the house, looking for a rival, but the rival finds him before he does. A fight ensues, 
in which the firearm is quickly found on the floor and rolled under the bed. The big guy beats up the intruder to decide once and for all who is an assassin and who is a pathetic Templar. The assassin has to run all over the house, fighting back with improvised objects. He almost succeeds in strangling the target, but he falls on his back, crushing him with his own weight. An iron poker comes into play, somewhat equalizing the weight categories. But even so, the guest cannot win. The host throws him to the floor, nails him with an overturned table, and grabs the barrel. In a deft move, the killer sits him on the wooden table leg with his heel, just like an unconventional vampire. The guest takes advantage of the momentum and hides behind a kitchen cabinet. Distracted by a thrown rag, the killer runs into the bedroom where he has dropped his gun. The wounded thug follows him, but finds a bullet through the closed door. The hitman comes out next to take a control shot to the head. Professionals have their own standards. The noise of the shot will be a sleeping pit bull. The beast rushes into the house where, after sniffing the owner's torso, he realizes what's going on. Not wanting to take the sin on his soul by killing the pet, the killer makes his feet, managing to escape at the very last moment. Throwing a Molotov cocktail to cover his tracks, the killer gets back into his car and drives away. Next stop, New York. In the suburbs, he tracks down a woman who looks like a cottonmouth. She leaves her house late at night and drives to a restaurant, not noticing the stalker with bad intentions, even as he approaches her at a stoplight. When the victim stops at the restaurant, the killer joins her table, offering to taste the lead dessert. Realizing that it's futile to jump in, the woman asks permission to taste the last meal, which she generously dilutes with alcohol. In the process, she talks a lot, hoping to put the silent partner's vigilance to sleep, and also tries to lighten the mood with a joke. After one last drink, the killer takes the woman out for some fresh air. As she walks down to the embankment, she slips and falls. She reaches out for help, but is shot in the forehead. As she falls, a knife is seen in her left hand. She wanted to surprise the assassin with a hidden blade. Uh, the next target is a customer in Chicago. Once there, the assassin follows a billionaire named Claiborne to choose a plan of action, just like Danila Bagrov in the marketplace. The killer infiltrates the gated parking lot of a luxury apartment complex when a car pulls out of there to gather information about the door locks. He orders an electronic key duplicator on Amazon, then walks past the billionaire driver to visually assess his physical features and approximate fitness level. The assassin walks into the fitness club, where the target works out and signs up for a trial week, a membership in one of many names. He then contacts a local gun dealer to purchase a handgun for personal use. After receiving the package from Amazon, he prepares for a retaliation operation. On the appointed day, Killer goes to the fitness club, clipping an electronic key card in the process from a gawking janitor. In the locker room, he overhears Claiborne talking to a personal trainer. When they go to workout, the killer opens the billionaire's locker, using the janitor's pass to get the electronic key to the apartment and copy it on a cheap device. Putting the key back in its place, the killer leaves the fitness club. In the evening, after waiting for the gate to be opened by a food delivery man, the killer enters an elite apartment complex. Using a copied key, he gets to the billionaire's apartment and enters it. He is chatting on the phone, but seeing the armed guest realizes that it is better to interrupt. Killer accuses the old man that he sicked his colleagues on him after the failure in Paris. But Claiborne denies his involvement. It was the first time he applied for such a service at all, and does not know how things work. According to him, Hodges himself offered to fix things, without specifying exactly how. Since there are no personal differences between them, the killer for some reason decides to let the customer live, but reminds him that if the billionaire sends mercenaries after him, he will return and punish him severely. The killer returns to the Dominican Republic where he lives with his girlfriend gradually getting used to a well-deserved pension, at least until the sequel. This is where the movie ends. So. Watch our channel, subscribe to it, and leave your ratings. 